join me in giving a very warm welcome to the one, the only, Ron Dunn. Good morning, man. So while I was at Uncle Gary's funeral, I did some math, and I was counting the hours of how long it had been since he was passed, and while we were sitting there looking at his open casket in front of the church, right? And it was 40 hours. So my mind thought, wow, what has he experienced in the last 40 hours? His body is here, but Gary's not here, right? And what is it that he has been experiencing? And my thought went to my mom, who's been there for seven years. If she could come back and have an hour conversation, what would she say? How, how, what, what has that been like for her? What's been going on? Uh, you know, Walt Hendrickson was Gail Jackson's mentor. And uh, I had the privilege to be under his teaching quite a bit. And I still remember the first time when uh, Walt was flying into Atlanta to speak at a men's conference and Gail said, someone needs to pick him up. And I jumped up and said, I'll do it. Because I thought, wow, I get like an hour in a car with Walt Hendrickson. That's going to be really awesome. So I picked him up and, and uh, we were driving up 400 coming up this way. And and uh, I almost remember the spot where he turned to me and he said, Ron, so would you rather be alive or die? And so I paused for a second. I said, I would choose life. And he said, why? And I said, well, because I spent a whole lot of my time as an adult self-absorbed and not really living for God's glory, not really living for him and I want this sometimes <laughs> to live for him and, and to be able to do that here so that life rewards will, will be a little different for me up there as you teach rewards. And he said, hmm, I'd rather die. <laughs> and I was glad I was driving at that moment, not him. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but that conversation stuck with me and it caused me to think a whole lot more and drive a little bit deeper. Why is it? Because when Walt taught, his perspective was so alive on what we are headed toward all of eternity and that he wanted so much, was so much looking forward to being with Jesus. It was so real with him when he taught it. It, almost, it would jump off the pages. And so what is it that we can know about our time up there? Our, our theme verse for this series, go ahead and look at it. It's the, it's the first verse on the bifold, and it's from 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 and 10. It says, but as it has written, have been written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. So how does the Spirit reveal things like this to us? What we have to look forward to, some of the mysteries, some of the great things that are going to happen in heaven. Well, the Spirit speaks to us through a number of ways, right? Through prayer, through quietness with Him. But primarily how the Spirit speaks to us is through the Word. In God's Word, over 500 verses talks about what we have to look forward to in eternity what eternity is going to be like. So part of the goal of this series is to uncover some of those. And as you build your theology, okay, what you believe and know why you believe it, when we talk about heaven, today we're going to hit on some things that you can know. As you look at a casket, you can know what it is that's going on here and what, and what it is that's happening. So there's a tombstone in Shannon, Ireland. Uh, it was erected in 1873. It's at a very prominent cemetery. It's like the third tombstone in, so everybody that walks in sees it. The guy that put it up put it five feet high, and here's what he engraved on it. Remember, man, as you go by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you shall be. Prepare for death and follow me. And so it caused quite a stir, apparently, when that went up. And about two months later, somebody engraved a second stone and put it next to it. And that stone said, to follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> right? <laughs> so Jesus hits on this in Luke 16. And, and uh, it's on the front page of your bifold, just um, almost the entire story which Jesus tells. And so Jesus almost takes a split screen and talks about two different men that went to two different places. 
And this is not a parable, okay? In a parable, Jesus never mentions somebody by name. This is an actual story. Likely the people who are hearing this knew of Lazarus. So Jesus says, it's Luke 16, starting at 19. Now there was a rich man dressed in purple and fine linen who lived each day in joyous splendor. He had life going on, anything he wanted, pleasure. And then a beggar named Lazarus lay outside of his gate covered with sores and longing to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. So two screens, you got this guy who's living in the mansion, who has everything he wants, and you've got this guy, Lazarus, who's outside of his gate just begging for just some crumbs from his table. One day the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. Now when my grandfather died, I was 11 years old, and I remember my grandmother saying, the angels have carried him to heaven. And I thought, well, that's a pretty cool picture. And I didn't know if that was fable. I didn't know if that was you know, just something that we hoped for. Where did she get that from? Theology number one from the story is Jesus explains to us that when we die, angels will carry us. And it was carried by angels to Abraham's side. So what's Abraham's side? Your translation in your Bible might say Abraham's bosom. So some, in places in the Bible, it's called paradise. So there was a holding tank, basically, that was Abraham's bosom. That's where Old Testament saints went. We'll talk a little bit about that more in a minute. Okay, so that's where this guy, Lazarus, was carried. And the rich man also died and was buried. Now, notice, the beggar died, wasn't buried. The rich man died and was buried. The rich man was poor. Likely he was thrown in potter's field or put in the garbage dump to burn outside the city. The rich man died and was buried. He had a funeral. He had a burial. And in those times, they would make it a big affair. So going out, you could be remembered. They would hire mourners, <laughs> you know, make it a big, 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 big event. Verse 23, in Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham from afar with Lazarus by his side. And so he cried out. All right, so three things here we can know. Uh, he was in misery. He had memory. He knew Abraham, he knew who, he saw Lazarus, and he was in mourning, he cried out. And the rich man also, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> he, so he cried out. So Father Abraham, he cried out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am agony in this fire. We have a picture of hell being like fire. Where does that come from? It comes from Jesus' picture, Jesus' picture of what it is. Uh, and so, but Abraham answered to him, child, why do you call him a child? Well, he was an Israelite. And Abraham is the father of Israel. Child, remember that during your lifetime, you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here while you are left to suffer. The exact opposite. And besides all this, a great chasm has been fixed between us and you so that even those who wish who wish cannot cross from here to, to you, nor can anyone cross from there to us. There's another thing we can know about the afterlife. It's set. There's a chasm. You can't go from one to the other, backwards or forward. Upon our death, our destiny is set. Okay, so, interesting story, right? Question is, so what happens today? As I was looking at Uncle Gary's body, his body was here. Where was Gary? Where was he taken? Was he taken to this place called Abraham's bosom? Abraham's side paradise? Where exactly is Gary? When we go to a funeral, where are believers today? Well, turn over. Where are they now? Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, Brothers, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you will not grieve like the rest who are without hope. So when we go to, to a funeral, 
We don't have to be uninformed. Nor do we have to mourn like those who have no hope. Of course we're going to mourn. Of course we're going to miss the person if we're close to them. There's a separation. It wasn't intended to be this way, right? So yes, there's going to be mourning. But we can be informed about what's going on. What are we informed about? Well, look at Acts 7, verse 59 through 60. Stephen. They were stoning Stephen as he called out. His body was dying. His body was being crushed to death by stones. And he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And saving this, he fell asleep. So throughout the Bible, we hear that term about falling asleep. What sleeps? Uh, if you back up three years before that happened, Jesus is on the cross. And the thief looks at him, the second thief looks at him and says, remember me. And Jesus says, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, his body wasn't with parad in paradise with him that day, but his spirit was. So what, take, what took place? What changed all this? What happened after Jesus died? Well, we don't have time to unwrap this today, but let me give you the lead at where to look at it. In Ephesians 4, what it talks about, I have one of the verses there. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives away and gave gifts to men. What happened after Jesus, when Jesus ascended? He went into Abraham's bosom, he went into paradise, and he freed all the captives of the Old Testament. And he took them to heaven with him in the presence of the Lord. So that holding tank was only until Jesus died on the cross, took it all upon himself, rose from the dead, and then ascended into heaven. And on the way to heaven, he took the captives. He took the Old Testament saints. And so now that holding tank no longer exists. Hades still does. That is the holding take until the final judgment when those will be taken into the lake of fire with Satan and all, of his, all the demons. So, all right. Now, so what sleeps? The Bible talks about us sleeping. Um, I didn't put the verse in here, but in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8 and 9, go ahead and write that down, and you may want to check that out. It says, we walk by faith, not by sight. To be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. So there is some teaching out there that says that when we die, we're just dead. We're sleeping. There's nothing alive until Christ comes back. If you take all the Bible into consideration, that's not what takes place. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Stephen said, Receive my spirit. So upon death, when we're looking at that body, the body is sleeping. That's what sleeps. This earthly body is sleeping for a period of time. Our spirit is taken to heaven. When Jesus comes back, the two join together. So let's, talk, let's look at a few strange verses in the Bible that actually explain this. When you read the verses by their own, it's not easy to connect the dots. When you read them in context of this whole subject, it starts making sense. So let's look at them real quickly. Uh, Philippians 1, verse 21 through 23. This is the verse that Walt lived his life. I mean, this, is, this was where, what he hung on and where his heart was in his, in his ending days. To me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that's far better. What Paul is saying is that if he had his choice between living or departing, he'd take departing, but he's departing to be with Christ. He's not departing to be asleep <laughs> until Christ returns. Upon death, we're instantly with Christ. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15, 19 through 22. If our hope in Christ is for this life alone, we are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have, have fallen asleep. 
For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. So Paul's explaining to us that Jesus is the first fruits of a resurrection. What is he the first fruits of? Well, he's the first fruits of a bodily resurrection. His body has already raised. And from him, we'll get an example of what our body will, be, will eventually be like. So when will our bodies be raised? Jesus is the first fruit. Our bodies sleep for a period of time. When will our bodies be taken? When I came in this morning, a couple guys at the table here said, are you going to be buried or cremated? And is there any biblical grounds against, either, against cremation? And the answer is, no, there isn't. If there is, somebody show me where it is. Jesus can put back together whatever we do. <laughs> We're going to go dust to dust. Whether the worms eat you, <laughs> whether you try to preserve it, whether you're buried, whether you're cremated, Jesus is coming back to get our body. Okay, and so when's that going to happen? Listen, I tell you a mystery. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 30, 53. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. We're talking, we're talking about our bodies. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, the scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. So, Uncle Gary, his body's there. His body has now been cremated. At some point in time when Jesus returns, that body's going to be put back together, imperishable. So what form is he in right now? What form is my mother in right now? What form are those that you know who are already with the Lord? What form are they in right now? Well, Paul talks about that. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1 through 5. For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is, when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself, and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies. Yes. <laughs> and we long to be put on, put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. For we, we will put on heavenly bodies. We will, be, we, will, we will not be spirits without bodies. While we live in the, these earthly bodies, we groan and sigh. But it's not what we want to, excuse me, but it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so that these di dying bodies will be swallowed up by victory. God himself has prepared us for this and as a guarantee, he's given us the Holy Spirit. So how do we know this is true? That's our hope, right? We're gonna be buried instantly. Angels usher us to heaven in the presence of the Lord. He has a temporary body he himself has made for us to house our spirit. How do we know that's true? He said, because I gave you the Holy Spirit. Do you know the Holy Spirit's inside? Do you sense that? Do you feel that? You feel that? This is also true. We live by faith, but faith that's backed up by the Spirit working in us, knowing things because God's, re God's revealed these mysteries to us so we can go to a funeral and not be so confused about what do I believe and what, what, how do I look at this and what's happening he gives us insights into his word. Take a look at what he says in first, and I gave the wrong reference there. So it should be 1 Corinthians 15, 40, and then verses 43 and 44. There are heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly one is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. It is sown in dishonor, that means buried. It's buried in dishonor, and it's raised in glory. What does that mean? Well, if we wanted to really make the point that you wouldn't forget, I'd have everybody stand up and take off their shirts right now. <laughs> if we looked around, we'd see some, some bodies that are going to be buried in dishonor, right? That's what <laughs> 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 No matter what we try to do, guys, we're, 
we're, our bodies are aging. That's what Paul talks about. Our bodies are groaning. I spent the last two weeks getting my house ready to get for sale. I'm exhausted at the end of the day. My body is not what it used to be. But that's part of it. So, yeah, I long for the new body. My, I talked to my brother yesterday. My dad's 89 years old, and um, he's not remembering things like he used to. Some big things that are happening, he doesn't remember. Uh, he's playing, he loves playing a game called Sheep's Head up there. He can't quite remember the rules anymore. But we, when you talk to him, what well, you know what he's looking forward to? What Paul was talking about, getting rid of this body that's broken down, this mind that's no longer working, and receiving a new body. <laughs> Get rid of the dishonored body, the one that's breaking down, and receive this new body of glory. Uh, it's raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So, last verse there, Luke, Luke 24. What will our bodies be like? Well, Jesus is the first fruits of a body being risen. So we can learn lessons from what he was like after he rose from the dead for what our bodies will be like. So... There's this scene where Jesus meets the disciples on the shoreline, and they realize it's him, and they, Peter jumps in the water and swims to him, and they're all so excited they can hardly control themselves. And it says, look at my, Jesus says to them, look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see for, see for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. We're going to have flesh and bones. And while they were still in disbelief because of their joy and amazement, he asked them, have you anything to eat? And so they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in front of them. So yeah, we're going to be eating in heaven. We'll, we'll get into that in week four. But we'll be eating from the tree of life. We're going to be having dinners. We're going to be having celebrations. We're going to eat for pleasure, <coughs> not because our bodies need it. If you piece together everything that Paul says everything that, that's in the Bible, this is what we can know about our new bodies in heaven. They're going to be indestructible. They're going to be imperishable. We'll never die. They're going to be infinite. They're going to be unlimited. Just like Jesus could travel from here to there, we're going to be able to travel from here to there. It's hard for our, it's hard for our minds to imagine but it's not impossible for us to start to get there. We just have to take the time to do it. And I propose to you that taking the time to research this for yourself, study this for yourself, spend some time alone with you and God discussing what is this going to be like? What do you want me to realize? Well, I'm living in this life, and guys, it is so easy for us to think life's about us, right? And even when we read the Bible, to think that, how does this help me? <laughs> when really the right way to read scripture, the right way to see the world is what is God up to? Ask yourself, what is it that God's up to? What's his heart? What's his desire? What's he been moving? What was this battle that took place between him and Satan? Why were we put on this planet? And what's our peace in all of this? And how do we glorify him? And how are we supposed to look at all this? And then how do we share this information so other people can round off how they view a very important topic? Uh, a friend of mine's a doctor, and he said, you know, Ron, if I wanted to become a millionaire fast, all I have to do is put something on the market that has any promise of bringing youth back to women or bringing youth back to men. If there's any promise of that, it'll sell. QVC will grab it. You can do an infomercial on it. It's billion, billions, and billions of dollar industry because everybody's trying to hang on to this to make young this body that's naturally decaying is going to go to sleep. Who's paying attention to the spirit inside of it that will live forever? And where are we headed with that? So um, I've been doing interviews this week. And uh, we're looking to hire two, new pe two key people. And so what's interesting to me is two questions I ask is, what's your ideal scenario? And why are you leaving the position you're in right now? And so the ideal scenario, three people in a row, work-life balance. Get that? 
why are you leaving the others? Why are you leaving your job you're in? Mundane. It's become boring. <laughs> you know that psychiatrist today. It used to be when most most of us grew up. Our number one goal in our job was to have significance, to make a difference, to do something that matters. Right? Let's do something in our life that's going to help people, or we're going to make a difference or matter in some way, and be really good at what we're doing. In this new emerging generation of workers, boredom, not being bored at what you do, is a really a high priority. So we're going to heaven for all eternity. Is there any chance it'll be boring there? <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? So we're going to send it to the tables. That's the fourth question. Try to work your way there to it. I'll come back at it, 10 tool, and we're going to end with talking about Will heaven ever get boring? So last question we had this morning was, how do we know that heaven won't be boring? What did you come up with a couple things at the table? Why won't heaven be boring? Dull, tiresome, dull, mundane over time. So eternity's a long time. To presume heaven is boring would mean that righteousness is boring. Because the only thing that would not be boring is to continue to sin. That's Satan's lie. Well said. No question about that. Anybody else? Hope. Oh, okay. So, so God's relational, right? And so imagine the millions of new relationships that we're going to encounter, the millions of new people that we're going to, billions at this point, right? How, do you ever find meeting somebody new boring? and getting to know them and getting to understand who they are and, and what their experiences have been, that can't be boring. It just can't be. Yeah, believers from all generations, right? People from, from various centuries and decades and all kinds of folks. So I, can't, I wrote down, jot down five reasons why we can know that heaven will not be boring. And isn't it kind of crazy that our society today is so worried about boredom? But if anybody says, well... <laughs> You know, the, the old joke was, I, I, I don't mind going to hell because all my friends will be there. It'll be a lot more fun and heaven will be boring, right? Well, what a, what a pack of lies that is. So here's, here's what I came up with. Five reasons why heaven won't be boring. Number one, God is not boring. To think that heaven would be boring, who created in us the desire for joy, the desire for excitement, the desire to even want that? God put that in us. Do you think the God that put us in it can't figure out a way to fulfill that? In our key verse, he says, it says that our heart can, doesn't even imagine what he's prepared for us. Someone with unlimited resources preparing a place for us and a time for us. What will that, we can't even fathom what it will be like. But we do know this, go to Psalm 16, verse 11, it says, in your presence is fullness of joy. All joy is totally fulfilled because God is there. Do you know that in heaven, we'll get into this in the week four as well. There's no need for a sun. There's no need for the moon. There's no need for the star. That super void that may very well be where heaven's located, they say it's a big void. There's nothing in there. How can that be? <clears throat> There's no need. Because in the new heaven, God's brightness shines for us. There's no need for light. He provides it all. We're going to be in the presence of God forever. There, is no, <laughs> there will be no room for dullness, tiresome, mundaneness. Second reason heaven won't be boring is because you will not be boring. So what we're looking at today is, I mean, why, why, why does someone become a boring person? This life can beat men down, right? And we walk around feeling like, I'm fat, I'm ugly, I'm stupid, I don't compare, I don't measure up. I didn't become, my dad was right, I didn't live up to what I, what I felt I could be someday. 
I'm not all that. And we start feeling more and more defeated, defeated, defeated till we just rescind and we become a boring person. Look around the table. Uh, no, don't do that. <laughs> all that's going to be wiped away. God removes all that from us. We have an imperishable body. All guilt is gone. In the presence of Jesus, we have no room to even think like that. We're loved and we're accepted, and we're going to live fullness of what he created, fully gifted, fully living it, fully using it. There's nothing that hinders us in heaven. Boredom has no room to breathe there. Another reason why we won't be bored is because your friends will not be boring. Listen to what it says in Hebrews 12 about who will be there. And Kevin, you're absolutely right. There's going to be so many people to meet from all time, all different nationalities, all different life stories. It's going to be endless who we're going to hang out with, who we're going to talk to. This is real stuff. This is really, we're not that far away from this, guys, right? So listen to what, he's, what Paul says, or whoever wrote Hebrews, probably Paul, but you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, God is there, the, heaven, the uh, heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. Myriads and myriads of angels are there. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn. That's us. We're the firstborn. You know God has no grandsons. We're a firstborn. Your relationship with God is not through any other person. It's not because of whoever's mentoring you, whoever's your pastor, whatever, you are firstborn. Direct relationship, directly God's son. All firstborn are there. To, the, to, the, to God, the judge of all. To the spirits of men made perfect. So to God, the judge of all. Jesus, they're talking about Jesus. Jesus is gonna be there. And then to the spirits of just men made perfect. Those are the Old Testament saints. All the Old Testament believers. All the New Testament believers, all the angels, Jesus, God, heaven's going to be such an incredible place to hang out. Your work will not be boring. If you go to Revelation 1, verse 1, here's what it says. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. Over and over in Revelation, when it paints the picture of what's going to happen, we're referred to as servants. We will be serving in heaven. We'll be using our gift and we'll, be, we'll have things to do. We're going to have a purpose for, for existence. We're going to be playing a part in this whole economy and this whole interaction that happens in heaven, perfectly fitted for how God's gifted us. And it's the place we've always longed for, fifth reason why it's not boring. So God is not boring. You won't be boring. Your friends aren't going to be boring. Your work won't be boring. And heaven is the place. We're going to finally be in the place that we always long for. No matter what it is that we hope for here, it never quite fulfills, does it? I mean, if, if I was reading yesterday, some friends from Wisconsin, you know, threw me a bleacher report read on some trash that came out about the Green Bay Packers, right? <laughs> and I read some of the comments. and I was like, man, alive. this is why we need to shine in the world, guys, because guys are so lost. You know, just people who are making that G on the Green Bay helmet their God, really. And that God has let them down. This is the reason why it happened. We, it's so sad to see that. It doesn't matter if we win a Super Bowl, how long does it last? It doesn't ever fulfill. No matter what it is that's here, it doesn't ever quite fulfill. And as we looked at last week in Ecclesiastes, God put in us, he placed in us eternity in our hearts. The place that will fulfill. When it can't be fulfilled here, it's something else. You know, Ken Boas says, what do you do with a broken story? And we all have broken stories, don't we, in our life? You attach it to a bigger story. You attach your story to a bigger story. Attach it to where God is doing, what he, where, where he's headed. This whole, th you know, society today is so bent more probably than ever on what, on ourselves and what we get out of things and what it means for us. Guys, we have to be men who are attaching our story to where God's moving and how he wants us to live so we can shine for him in a very dark place, in a very miserable place, in a very lonely place. If you, if you go on if you just read some comments on things that are out there, you realize how really sad and empty people are. That's who's around us, but we are different than that. We have something inside of us. We know facts like this. What do we do with it? 
How do we share it? How do we share the fact that there is a heaven that God is going to be there, the guy who created everything, and it's, he's, it's unimaginable what he's preparing for us. We're going to be there in a very non-boring state because everything's taken off of us. Our friends are going to be there in the same way. And it's the place we always long for. Romans 8, 22 for 23, Paul says, the whole creation groans with birth pains. And that is really true. Waiting for the coming of Christ. Now, between now and then, people are going to live and people are going to die. The reason we're doing this series so we can wrap our minds around what that means and what happens. And there are two ways everybody can go. What do we do with the fact that with those who we know don't know the truth? Pray for them. Keep on, have a list. Have, a, have your top 10 list. Be deliberate. Go out to dinner. Go where they hang out. Let them see. People are drawn to you. If you're really living your faith, people are drawn to you in a big way and they're checking you out all the time. They want to know what makes you tick. Take the step and verbalize it at some point. Let me share with you where my heart pounds. Let me show you what, where I discovered. I was like this, now I'm like this. What changed me? God's truth. Let me just share it with you. You're not selling anything. You're not pressuring anything, but you have a treasure. Let your light shine. Be salt. Provide flavor. Be bold in your faith. Not obnoxiously. Be yourself. We just be ourselves. Watch what doors are open, but we have to get engaged there. Have a list. Share these truths. Know who you're targeting. Change your schedule to spend some people who spend time with people who don't know him. Bring them along. Make a difference. Imagine what that'll be like in heaven. When somebody that you took the time with to go out to dinner, to go to a game with them, to go live where they live, and then you were instrumental in what the Holy Spirit was doing, what that celebration will be like with that person forever. I know some people I'm going to be looking for when I get to heaven who have impacted my life in such a big way. We have a room full of great guys here. Let's be great in this way. Every one of us touch somebody different. Let the Holy Spirit work through you. All right, guys, close at your table. Next week we'll be back with Hutch on identity theft. One Thing for Men meets at Cabernet Steakhouse in Alfreda, Georgia on Friday mornings from 7 to 8 a.m. If you live in the Atlanta area or visit the area on Friday, we would love to have you join us in person. And if you have been blessed by this message, please consider supporting One Thing for Men online.